Hello, my name is Michael Trower, an emergency medicine consultant, and this presentation is about point of care ultrasound and cardiac arrest. As emergency physicians, we're essentially generalists, but there are some situations in which we should be experts, and one such situation is in the management of cardiac arrest. In general, I think we're pretty good at managing cardiac arrest. However, in terms of the role of ultrasound, I think we have some room for improvement. There are some misconceptions about how it should be used. And so I hope at the end of this talk, you'll have a better understanding of the evidence for its use, and you'll be able to use it more wisely. So let's start with a case. A 73-year-old female is found unresponsive at home by her husband. He performs CPR for nine minutes until the ambulance arrives, and he notes that she's been generally unwell for the last few days. The paramedics continue with advanced life support for a further 15 minutes, so chest compressions, bagging through an eye gel, and regular adrenaline. She remains in PEA throughout, and when she arrives at ED, she's still in PEA, has an end tidal of 0.7, and this is her initial bedside ultrasound. This is a subcostal view. This is the right ventricle here and the left ventricle here. I'll just give you a moment to look at this and see what you think. So is there RV dilation? Yep, the RV is bigger than the LV. Is that significant? How about pericardial fluid? Can you see any rim of anechoic or black fluid around the heart here? Nope, there's no pericardial fluid. And how about cardiac activity? Is the heart moving? Yeah, there is rhythmic organized cardiac activity. And what's the significance of that? And what would you do for this patient? Would you continue the resuscitation? Would you stop the resuscitation? Would you give thrombolytics? Well, hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll have all the necessary information to be able to answer all of these questions. So what are the potential benefits of using ultrasound during a cardiac arrest? I think there are five potential benefits and I'll list them now in order from most important to least important. So the most important benefit, I think, is in identifying reversible causes in terms of the four edges and four Ts. Secondly, vascular access. Thirdly, ensuring effective chest compressions. Fourthly, in predicting outcome. And finally, in identifying pseudo-PEA. And what are the potential harms from using ultrasound during an arrest? Well, the main one is delaying chest compressions, and there is some evidence this can be a real concern. So it's paramount the team leader ensures that the ultrasound does not delay chest compressions and never goes on for more than the maximum 10 seconds during a rhythm pulse check. Misinterpretation of the ultrasound findings could, of course, also cause potential harm. So we won't talk about traumatic cardiac arrest in this talk because there's already a well-defined algorithm for how to manage this situation. And I don't think ultrasound really has much of a role. Essentially, we try and give oxygen, give blood, finger thoracostomies. If this doesn't work, consider a thoracotomy. And we're gonna go down the same pathway regardless of the ultrasound findings. So I don't think it has much of a role. And similarly, in shockable rhythms, ultrasound doesn't really have a role. The priority here is obviously just to shock them as soon as possible. The one exception is in differentiating fine VF and asystole. So occasionally the monitor may show what looks like asystole, but the patient actually might be in fine VF. And ultrasound can sometimes show you this. So in this clip, we can see, if you look closely, the LV muscle is actually quivering. There's a shaking, quivering movement. And so this is actually fine ventricular fibrillation, not asystole. So today we'll be focusing on non-traumatic, non-shockable arrests, so PEA and asystole. And there was a large paper 
published on this topic in 2016 by Gaspari et al. It was a prospective multi-center trial that looked at nearly 800 patients. So it's by far the biggest trial on this topic. And so they looked at adults with non-traumatic arrest who were in PEA or asystole. And their primary outcome was survival to admission. And they found that the presence of kydec activity had an odds ratio of 3.6, which was statistically significant for predicting survival to admission, so making it to intensive care. But this paper also looked at various other subgroups, and so we'll be referring to this paper quite a lot over this talk. So the first and most useful role of ultrasound in an arrest is identifying reversible causes. So let's run through the four T's and the four H's. So tamponade, thrombus, tension, toxins, hypovolemia, hypoxia, hyperkalemia, and hypothermia. So which of these can be identified with ultrasound? Tamponade, for sure. Thrombus, well, yeah, PE can be. Tension pneumothorax, yep. Toxins, no. Hypovolemia, yeah, potentially. Uh, but the rest, hypoxia, hyperkalemia, hypothermia, no. But still, four out of the eight can be identified. So that's pretty impressive. And let's go through each of them one at a time. So first, tamponade. So in the Gaspari paper, they found that 34 patients out of the nearly 800 had pericardial effusions, and they attempted pericardiocentesis in 13 of these. And in two of those 13, the patients survived to hospital discharge, so a survival rate of 15%, which is not bad. I would note that you can sometimes get hemopericardium from the rib and sternal fractures that may have been suffered from the actual chest compressions themselves, in which case it's unlikely to be the cause of their arrest. So bear this in mind. However, if you think that the patient has a significant effusion and that this could be the cause of their arrest, then by all means go ahead and attempt pericardiocentesis as soon as possible. How would you perform pericardiocentesis? I think it's worth thinking about the practicalities of this and what kit you would use. So the cardiologists have their own dedicated pericardiocentesis kit up in their lab, but I think we should probably choose something that we're more familiar with. So there's no absolute um, you know, right or wrong answer here. I think some people like using spinal needles, you can use cannula, you can use a central line kit, whatever you choose it should be something you're familiar with, uh, that you know where it is, and you should have decided what you're going to use beforehand. I would recommend ultrasound guidance rather than just the anatomical technique where you go subcostally and point to the left scapula. If you use ultrasound guidance, you can choose the point where the pericardial fluid is of the greatest depth, whether this is subcostally, parasternally, apically. And you can also do the procedure with in-plane needle guidance. So using the phase array probe, you can actually visualize the needle in in plane into the pericardial space. So the second T is thrombus, and here we'll focus on pulmonary embolism. So in Gaspari, 15 patients received thrombolytics, and one of these survived to discharge. But the main point I want to make here is that RV dilation is not specific to PE in the context of an arrest. Argard is a Danish author who looked at 30 pigs, 10 of whom had a hypovolemic arrest, 10 hyperkalemic, and 10 arrhythmic. And in all 30 pigs, the RV dilated very quickly after they went into arrest. So this is a normal phenomenon. The RV is a thin-walled chamber, and as soon as you go into an arrest, it will just blow out. It's a normal phenomenon. It's not specific to pulmonary embolus. However, a DVT is highly specific to PE. In a paper by Nazarian, they found it was almost 98% specific for PE. And you can easily perform a two-point compression scan during a cardiac arrest, in fact, during chest compressions. By the way, all the references are included on the last slide of this talk. So the third T is tension pneumothorax. So this clip shows normal lung sliding. Lung sliding is that shimmering, glistening appearance of the pleural line. 
So if you see lung sliding, you know there's no pneumothorax at that point. This next clip shows the absence of lung sliding. So we can see that the muscles are moving, the patient is trying to breathe, but that pleural line is static. There's no shimmering, no glistening. So this suggests a possible pneumothorax on that side. The final clip shows the lung point, the transition point between sliding and no sliding. This is much more specific for a pneumothorax. However, during a cardiac arrest, it's unlikely you'll have the time to be able to identify a lung point. So if you can see an absence of lung sliding on one side, that's enough. Just go ahead and perform needle decompression or a finger thoracostomy on that side. So the one H that we can identify with ultrasound is hypovolemia. But I've put this last because I think it's the least important. So normally with ultrasound to assess for hypovolemia, we look at the IVC to see if it's narrow and collapsible and the LV to see if it's empty and has kissing walls. But in an arrest, these signs are unreliable. However, we can look for underlying causes of potential hypovolemia. So we can look for a AAA. Now, obviously the patient's gonna be bouncing around with the chest compressions. However, you should still be able to identify a AAA. And similarly with free fluid, if there's enough free fluid that has caused the patient to arrest, it will probably be quite obvious. And so even with a moving patient, you should be able to identify this during chest compressions. Okay, so we've talked about reversible causes. I think the next most important role of ultrasound in an arrest is IV access. So ALS tells us have two quick attempts at a peripheral IV, and if you fail, go straight to an IO. And I totally agree with this principle. Personally, I think I can get a peripheral cannula into a central vein just as quickly as I can put in an IO. So I will often just put a 14 gauge into either the femoral vein or the internal jugular vein. So the third potential benefit of using ultrasound during an arrest is to ensure efficacy of chest compressions. And what I mean here is ensuring that the chest compressions are over the LV rather than over other structures. MRI and CT studies have shown that if you just use the landmark technique, so the internipple line, lower half of the sternum, you'll actually be compressing over the base of the heart, so the LV outflow tract, the LVOT, or the aorta itself, rather than the ventricles. And human studies have confirmed this. Sung et al. in 2009 looked at 34 patients in cardiac arrest and performed transesophageal echo on each of them and found that the area of maximal compression in more than half of the cases was over the aorta and in the remainder was over the LVOT. So in fact, in none of the cases was the compression over the ventricle. In this clip, courtesy of Dr. Felipe Terran, we see a transesophageal echo during an arrest with chest compressions ongoing. So here is the aortic root. Here is the aortic valve. And here is the left ventricular outflow tract, the LVOT. And we can see that the compressions are over the LVOT. So that outflow tract is getting completely squashed and squished so that there's no space for blood to come through into the aorta. So here we know that there can't be any effective output because there's no room for the blood to actually get out from the LV into the body. So these must be ineffective chest compressions. Another paper in 2016 looked at the same question, but this time in pigs. So they took 26 pigs and they found that if you compress over the LV, then 70% of them got a ROSC, whereas if you compress over the aortic root, then 0% of them got a ROSC. And then just in 2019, Katina published a case series of 19 humans who had transesophageal echo during arrest, and he found that Seven out of the eight patients who had an open LVOT achieved ROSC, whereas zero of the 11 patients who had a closed LVOT achieved ROSC. So transesophageal echo is the gold standard in terms of assessing for the efficacy of chest compressions during an arrest. 
However, transthoracic echo can also be useful. You can see where the LV is and simply move your chest compressions over the LV. And if you do this, you should then reassess the patient to see if you've improved cardiac output. So if you've got an arterial line in, you can simply see if the BP has gone up, and it's the diastolic BP that is crucial in terms of coronary perfusion. If you don't have an arterial line, you could just feel the pulse, but if you're trained in Doppler, this may be a more accurate way of assessing for flow, for instance, over the femoral artery. And end tidal CO2 is a good uh, surrogate for cardiac output. So if end tidal CO2 goes up, that's a good sign that you've improved cardiac output. So the fourth potential benefit of using ultrasound in an arrest is in terms of predicting outcome or prognosis. And the Gaspari paper looked at this question in quite some detail in terms of whether the presence or absence of cardiac activity predicted outcome. So 14% of patients without cardiac activity achieved ROSC compared to 51% of patients with cardiac activity. And we should also define here what is cardiac activity. So it has to be movement of the myocardium, of the actual heart muscle. So it can just be a quivering or a flicker, some kind of twitch of the muscle, but it has to be the muscle, not just a valve flapping. It has to be the muscle moving. 7% uh, of patients with an absence of cardiac activity survived to ICU compared to 29% with cardiac activity. And 0.6% of patients without cardiac activity survived to make it home. So this was three patients out of the total of nearly 800. So as you can see, it's, it's obviously not good to have an absence of cardiac activity. It's a predictor of poor outcome, but it's not absolute. There were still three patients who made it home. So I don't think we can use this as a way of saying, right, cardiac stand still, you're done, stop. I think we have to factor it in with everything else. So we know that rhythm is an important predictor. We know asystole is the worst, PEA a little bit less bad, and shockable is the best. We know that a prolonged downtime and a low end tidal CO2 below two kilopascals are predictors of poor outcome. And so we should factor in the ultrasound findings with all these other findings. So if we think back to the case at the beginning, a 73 year old lady who'd had an unwitnessed collapse, so unknown downtime. She'd had over 20 minutes of CPR without a ROSC. She had a low end tidal CO2, but she had organized cardiac activity on ultrasound. So there's not a right or wrong answer here. I think overall, she's still got a pretty bleak prognosis. You know, it may be reasonable to continue a couple of cycles of CPR Check if you can find anything reversible on ultrasound or on your venous blood gas. And if you don't find anything and she remains in arrest, you know, within a few minutes, it would be reasonable to stop. But I think the main point is use the presence or absence of cardiac activity to factor in with everything else to make a reasonable judgment about any meaningful chance of recovery and base your decisions on that. So the fifth and final of the potential benefits of using ultrasound in an arrest is identifying patients in pseudo-PEA. So pseudo-PEA is when the heart is beating, but just not strongly enough to create a pulse or a blood pressure. So you have a rhythm, the heart is moving on ultrasound with organized cardiac activity, but there's no pulse, no blood pressure. And Gaspari looked at this subgroup specifically and unsurprisingly, patients with organized activity, pseudo-PEA, had better survival than those with disorganized activity. But interestingly, they also looked at the effect of giving continuous adrenergic infusions to each group. And if you had organized activity, then they found better outcomes if you were on an inotrope infusion, like noradrenaline or metaraminol, as opposed to the unphysiological adrenaline bolus every four minutes. 
Okay, let's talk about some practicalities of how to use ultrasound during a cardiac arrest. And the first question is when to use it. Some advanced paramedics will actually perform this scan in the pre-hospital setting. But as an emergency physician, I think our choice is whether to perform it right at the beginning at the first rhythm pulse check or at the second rhythm pulse check. So there is a school of thought that the first rhythm pulse check should be about identifying a shockable rhythm. And if you do not find a shockable rhythm, then at the second rhythm pulse check, bring in the ultrasound. And that's pretty reasonable. Personally, I like to perform it right at the beginning at that initial pulse rhythm check. So as soon as the paramedics have transferred the patient across and they've moved their trolley out of the way, I'll move the ultrasound machine in, place the probe in the subcostal position, and then once the defib pads are attached, we've got someone looking at the monitor, someone feeling a pulse, then we'll stop chest compressions and I'll perform my echo right there at the beginning. Who should perform the scan? Well, obviously someone trained in echo and life support, but also ideally not the team leader. So the team leader can then have oversight over what's happening and ensure that the scan is not delaying chest compressions. If you choose to be the team leader and do the scan, you need to take personal responsibility that you're not gonna go over that 10 seconds. How should you perform the scan? Well, before the patient arrives, turn the machine on, choose the phased array probe, put some gel on the probe, type in patient details just using a rest because you won't have the details yet, and then set the clip length to 10 seconds. As soon as you are scanning, immediately press record video, and then you can use the subsequent two minutes to go back and look at that 10 second clip before reporting your findings to the team leader. And prepare for how you're gonna use ultrasound during an arrest. So this could involve some mental preparation. This could involve in situ simulation, but you should know exactly how you're gonna use the ultrasound and also what you're gonna do if you actually find some reversible causes. So if you see pericardial fluid, what are you gonna do? If you see a DVT, what are you gonna do? If you see an absence of lung sliding, what are you gonna do? Know exactly what you will do in every situation so you can anticipate everything that could potentially happen. Various protocols have been described for the use of ultrasound in cardiac arrest, and they all involve some combination of heart, lung, DVT, AAA, free fluid, in various different orders. There is some flexibility here. If you have a young man with Marfan's who developed sudden pleuritic chest pain, then became breathless, went blue and collapsed, you probably want to look at lung sliding first. Or if you have uh, someone who's just been on a long flight, developed some leg swelling and then collapsed, you probably want to look at their leg veins first. So there is some flexibility. But this is the Trauer approach. So a generic approach to using ultrasound in non-traumatic, non-shockable cardiac arrest. So first, we perform an echo at the initial rhythm pulse check, and we look for three things. Pericardial fluid, and if there is pericardial fluid, we consider performing immediate pericardiocentesis, ideally under ultrasound guidance. Cardiac activity. So this is a useful prognostic sign. And if there's organized cardiac activity, this group of pseudo PEA may benefit from being on an inotrope infusion rather than the unphysiological four minutely adrenaline bolus. And finally, LV position. And if the chest compressions are not over the LV, then adjust the position of chest compressions accordingly. Then during the next two minutes, I would perform two point compression DVT. So of the femoral and popliteal veins on each side. And this can easily be done within two minutes. And while you're there, if you don't have access, consider popping in a 14 gauge into the femoral vein. At the second rhythm pulse check, I would look for lung sliding. And then over the next two minutes, consider looking for a AAA or free fluid. Finally, at the third rhythm pulse check, I would go back and reassess the heart. 
So is there kinetic activity? Are we compressing over the LV? So this is a generic, sort of standard approach to using ultrasound in an arrest, but feel free to adapt it, personalize it depending on your own skills and come up with your own algorithm. But whatever you decide on, mentally rehearse it and know exactly how you're going to use ultrasound during an arrest because in a stressful situation you don't want to be making it up off the cuff. You want to have decided beforehand exactly how you're going to use it. Judging by this man's skin color, hypoxia would be quite high up my list of differentials. But let's summarize a systematic approach to using ultrasound in an arrest. So first, at time zero, at the initial rhythm pulse check, we'll do a subcostal echo. Then over the next two minutes, we'll move down to the legs and look for DVT and also consider IV access. Then we'll check the lungs for sliding at the next rhythm pulse check. Then over the next two minutes, we'll consider looking for a AAA or free fluid. And then finally, at the third rhythm pulse check, four minutes in, we'll go back and reassess the heart. Okay, some take home points for today. Firstly, in the context of a cardiac arrest, RV dilation is not specific to PE. However, the presence of a DVT is highly specific. So to diagnose a PE during an arrest, look at the leg veins, not at the RV. And if you see a DVT, go ahead and give thrombolysis. Secondly, ensure chest compressions are actually over the LV. So we know from imaging and from transesophageal echo that if we just use an anatomical landmark technique, we're often not compressing the LV, we're compressing the aorta or the LVOT, in which case no blood is going to be getting to the patient. We can use transthoracic echo to try and adjust and improve the position of our chest compressions. And finally, cardiac standstill is bad. It's a predictor of poor outcome, but it's not a death sentence. Three of those patients from the nearly 800 in the Gaspari paper did make it out of hospital alive. So we should factor this in with all our other information. If you have a young patient with a brief downtime, a good end tidal CO2, and you don't see any cardiac activity, that isn't an absolute reason to stop. However, on the other hand, if you have a patient who had a long downtime, is in asystole, has a low end tidal, and you think you can see some cardiac activity, that also isn't a reason to continue. It's just one more factor that you should incorporate into your decision making. On the left are the references from the talk, and on the right are some resources if you'd like to learn more on this topic. So if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email or a tweet. I'm always happy to talk about this really interesting topic and be challenged on some of my opinions. Thanks very much for listening.